a boy was asked in Sunday school what his definition of Father's Day was. He said, it's just like Mother's Day, but it's less expensive. <laughs> Happy Father's Day to all the fathers that are here and I see a family. Since our time is limited, I want to pay close attention to the outline that was handed to you for us as we reflect on God's word and uh, meditate on the word of God for our edification and for our growth. <clears throat> the subject of uh, my meditation that I want to share from God's word is a call to maturity. On this Father's Day, we want to reflect that God has indeed issued a call, and that call is for us to grow up, for us to mature, from going from boyhood to manhood, for us to take the responsibility that God has placed upon us, for us to understand that God has given to us a special assignment, and we need to fulfill that assignment, that we should not abdicate our responsibility, but take up our responsibility and uh, grow up and fulfill that assignment that God has given to us. And uh, for our meditation, I want us to focus on a name that is going to be very familiar for us in the days to come. That name is James. And I chose that in the light of the dedication of James, and it is our practice for us in our church that names have significance. It has a prophetic meaning as well. So I want us to look into that name and what that name means, and also for us to glean the spiritual truth that God wants us to glean, and so that we can apply valuable lessons for our spiritual life. Uh, in your outline, the number one is five men in the New Testament are called James. And because there are five men that are called James in the New Testament, there is a lot of confusion that abounds as to who is who. And so often we get confused as to what, uh, which James uh, is the writer talking about. Uh, although there are five James that are uh, mentioned in the New Testament, Three of them are prominent. The other two are mentioned, and we do not have much information regarding them, except they were fathers of other James. And uh, the three that are prominent, number one in your outline, number, uh, point number two, James, the son of Zebedee. And we have most references concerning James, uh, the son of Zebedee, and there are 21 references in the New Testament concerning James, son of Zebedee. And he was the brother of John. He was also an apostle that Jesus enlisted. And Jesus spent all night before he chose his 12 disciples or apostles, and he was one of them. And this James, son of Zebedee, worked with his father. And he also worked with his brother. And they were in fishing business. And we read of that in so many different places. In the list of the apostles, his name is always mentioned number three. He is always mentioned number three in the list that is mentioned in the Gospels of Luke and Mark. Uh, he's number three, it is Peter, James, and John. Uh, Peter, John, and James. And uh, these uh, two brothers, James was the brother of John. John was the youngest of the disciples. And James was probably the oldest. And he was, uh, 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 they were called the sons of thunder. You remember that phrase that Jesus used, sons of thunder. And the reason why that phrase is used is these two brothers had a fiery temper. I'm sure they fought. How many of you have fought with your siblings? Okay. Thanks for all the honest hands that went up. 
uh, except Rajesh. You know, he, uh, he has never fought with his brother or sister. It's because he's, uh, he doesn't have one. <laughs> but if you have a brother or sister, you always have a sibling rivalry. And James and John had a fiery temper. On one time, we find that James and John both asked Jesus permission to call down fire on a village that was full of Samaritans. And the reason was these Samaritan people in that particular village did not receive Jesus. So because they did not receive Jesus or accept Jesus, they said, let's call down fire from upon this village. But Jesus did not allow them to do that. And another time we find that they had the audacity to come with their mother and approach Jesus and ask for special positions. They knew it was only a matter of time when Jesus would overthrow the existing Roman government and establish his geopolitical kingdom. So they said, when you come into your kingdom, would you make sure that uh, one of us sit on your right and the other on your left? It was basically asking for key cabinet positions in when Jesus would come and establish his kingdom. And so we knew, we know that they had political ambitions. They were people that craved for power. They were people that longed for status and position. It was amazing that Jesus enlisted them as his disciples. People with different temperaments and different moods, all working together. And Jesus, how Jesus changed and transformed them to be his ambassadors and his witnesses. And later on, when you come to Acts chapter 12, we realize that he was the first apostle to die, to be executed and to die as a martyr. And he was killed and executed by Herod, King Herod Agrippa I, and that we read in Acts chapter 12. And the incidents that happened in Acts chapter 12 took place 12 years after the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. By that, uh, and then we find it was the same uh, James that Jesus took along with Peter and John to Mount Transfiguration. And they were given the privilege of seeing the, the, uh, the change and the transformation and the glory of Jesus on that Mount Transfiguration. And then we find that it was these three that was called by Jesus who were part of the inner circle to be with him and to pray with him in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he took them further than the other disciples and said, would you watch with me and pray with me for an hour? So this is all about James, the son of Zebedee. Then you have James, the son of Alphaeus, and he's mentioned about 10 times. And he's called James the Less. We don't know much about him, except he was also one of the 12 apostles of Jesus. And uh, he served Jesus faithfully as well, but we do not have much information concerning him. And the third James that is prominent and that we are going to focus our study upon is James, who was known and referred to as the brother of Jesus. He was the stepbrother of Jesus. And we find that James, the stepbrother of Jesus, did not follow Jesus or believe in him and was not a disciple of Jesus while he was on this earth. And it was only after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus that he realized this brother who grew up with him, who worked with him, and who was with him for all those 30 years was really the Messiah. And uh, Jesus made a special appearance to him. And Paul refers to that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 7. Number 3 on your outline. Jesus made a special appearance to James after his resurrection. It was that special appearance of Jesus that made 
James a believer. He had high respect for Jesus. He knew that Jesus was a holy person. He knew that Jesus never lost his cool, never lost his temper, and he knew that he was a person who followed God. But it was hard for him to understand that his brother, his sibling, was the Messiah. So it was very hard for him. And not only that, historians say that James was a Nazarite meaning that he had taken a Nazarite vow as a young person. A Nazarite, uh, a person who takes a Nazarite vow, you know, he does not touch anything that is dead. So that means he would never attend a funeral. One reason why we don't read of him while Jesus was hanging on the cross. He never uh, was there. Even though his brother was being crucified like a criminal, he refused to go there. And we see that he was not there to accompany his mother. Therefore, Jesus gave the responsibility of taking care of his mother to who? To John. He said, behold your son and behold your mother. So John happily took on that responsibility and said, I will take care of uh, uh, Mary, your mother. And so we find that uh, he was a person who took a Nazarite vow. He would grow long hair. And also he was a vegan. He never touched any animal food. And that was because he was a Nazarite and he had taken on that vow. And he was a person who was given to the Old Testament. He knew the Old Testament. He studied the Old Testament. And he wanted to please God in every aspect of his life. He was very, very committed to his uh, vows to the Lord. And he did not touch uh, any strong drink. Uh, no fruit of the wine. And he was a person who, was, uh, who abstained from anything that would be of a worldly nature. That was James, even prior to his conversion as a disciple and a follower of Jesus Christ. And then when he had this special appearance of Jesus and he knew that his brother was indeed the Messiah, he was risen, uh, uh, risen from the dead, he ardently followed Jesus and became a disciple. Within 12 years or less than that, he became a prominent leader of the church. In fact, he became the senior pastor of the church in Jerusalem. He was more prominent than Peter or John. We read about Peter, we read about John, we read about Paul because they were engaged in missionary activities. Luke was recording the travels of Peter and Paul. Luke was recording what God was doing to expand the work of God. Luke was recording how Paul was called of God to be an apostle to the Gentiles. The mission of James was his mission was to the Jews and he was the one who kept the church in Jerusalem together. And therefore we read how prominent he was in Acts chapter 12 verse 17. When Peter is put in prison and the angel of the Lord comes and delivers him. The first thing he tells, he says, go tell James, the brother. He wanted to make sure that he would report back to James and James would know that all is safe. So Peter submitted himself to the spiritual authority of James. Not just because he was a brother of Jesus. Yes, there was an element in that. But also because he was a person who was a mature person who knew the Old Testament. Who was more Jewish than anybody else. And the early Christians were basically Jewish converts. And the early Christians went to the synagogues on a regular basis. It was much later that they started, had to be, as they were evicted, they started their own gatherings. So it was a Jewish congregation. It came out of the Jewish faith and he was very Jewish in his approach. And it was particular that people would keep the law. 
And therefore, in the book of James, and he's the one who, by the way, wrote the book of James. Do you know, it is the book of James that is the first book to be written in the New Testament. Matthew's gospel came 7 to 13 years later. Mark's gospel came 7 to 9 years later. The first book to be written in the New Testament was the book of James. It was only four or five years later that Paul wrote his first letter. And that was to the church in Galatia. Galatians is the first book that Paul wrote, writes. So James is the book that the people of the early church read. And he wrote it to the church that was dispersed throughout Asia. And he being the brother of Jesus, he being the senior pastor of Jerusalem, was giving directions, was giving commands. And by the way, there are 54 commands in that five chapters of the book of James. He's issuing commands and the book of James, you can sit, read it in one sitting. It is so simple. Every word is simple and intelligible. Anybody can understand the book of James. And it is intensely practical. He was helping the church to understand how to live a Christian life. And he was also referred to as James the Just. That was another nickname that was given to him. Another nickname that he had was one who had camel knees. One who had camel knees. You know why? Because he would spend so many hours on his knees in prayer. He developed calluses on his knees. He was a person who had a pastoral heart, who cared for people. I was preaching in a very large church in Chennai about 22, 23 years ago. Multiple services. Each service was two hours long. I noticed there was a man who was on his knees the entire service. Except for the time of standing or singing during an entire time of preaching, which was an hour long. And then all the other times he was on his knees. I asked the pastor later, is he like that all the time? He said, every Sunday, the entire time he's on his knees. Concrete floor, just straw mats. Imagine being on a concrete floor, straw mats, being on your knees for two hours. That's commitment. You don't go to sleep, by the way, if you're on your knees. James was a person who spent so much of time on his knees praying for people that he developed Calluses on his knees. His spiritual posture was very important. Our spiritual posture is very important. If your spiritual posture is, is in, in order, your spiritual antenna also will be in the right location. So often our spiritual posture is not proper. Therefore, our spiritual antenna is off. Therefore, we cannot receive anything from the Lord. In Galatians chapter 1 verse, chapter 1 and verse 2, some of the most valuable information that you will ever receive on Paul is written in Galatians chapter 1 and 2. He gives an insight into the life of James. He gives an insight into the life of Peter. He gives an insight into the life of the early church. And there in Galatians, you read that even Paul submitted himself to the spiritual authority of James. He said, I went to Jerusalem for with one purpose. I wanted to make sure that I have fellowship with James and Peter. He spends 15 days at one trip with Peter. He says, except for Peter, except for Peter, the only other person I was interested to see and spend time was James, the brother of our Lord. When James sent some of his representatives to find out what was happening, 
The church in Galatia received them with reverence and respect. When an ambassador of America goes to another country, the way you treat that ambassador is a reflection of how you treat the president of that country. When somebody sends somebody on their behalf, the way you treat that person is very important. So Paul says, we received the brethren that was sent by James. And Paul submitted himself and reported concerning his travels and ministry to James. In fact, Paul refers to him as an apostle. Peter refers to him as an apostle. He was not an apostle when Jesus was on this earth. But because he had a special appearance with Jesus, he was referred to as an apostle and later became the senior pastor, giving oversight to the mother church and even to Peter, John, and Paul. Number five, his authority is seen in the statement, wherefore my sentence is, when you read Acts chapter 15, it's a powerful chapter that shows how important a council meeting was. They had a gathering of all the apostles because they had to debate and discuss and come to a conclusion of how they were going to treat the Gentiles. And they were to set some standards as to what should be allowed and what should not be allowed. So there were a lot of questions in the early church. And so they listened to both sides. There was debate. They were listened to both sides. And some who were the Jewish legalists, they said, no, we must do this. They must be circumcised. And they began to debate about all these things. And the others who were working among the Gentiles like Paul said, no, we should not put these burdens on them. The Lord does not require those burdens. And James was the one who was chairing that meeting. He was a chairperson. And after he heard all the debate like a judge, he issues his decree and he says, wherefore my sentence is. And brings that meeting to a conclusion. And we are practicing what we are practicing today because of what James did 2,000 years ago. Can you say praise the Lord? God chose James to be a spiritual authority figure in the early church. And to execute things with justice. And it resonated in the hearts and the minds of all the people that were assembled there. His authority is seen the way he handled that meeting in Acts chapter 15. Number six, Paul recognized James along with Peter and John to be the pillars in the church. He uses that phrase pillars in the book of Galatians. He says there are certain people that are strong pillars of a church. And the ones who were the pillars of the early church was Peter, John, and James. As I mentioned, the first book in the New Testament they written was written by James. And other books came much later. Number seven. James, the senior pastor, the authority figure of the early church, the one who held the early church together in times of storms, in times of debate, in times of factions and divisions. He held the church together and people respected him because he was a just man. He was a prayerful person. He was a humble person. He was a person who knew the word of God very well. He was a person who was able to give direction to Apostle Peter, Apostle John, and Apostle Paul. He was a person who understood what his mission was. James did have enemies, and he refers to that. And who were the enemies of James? It was the intellectuals of his day, the liberals of his day. The people that questioned the supernatural, they were the intellectuals. People that believe that to be a Christian, all that you need to do is your, give your intellectual consent. That's all that matters. 
You can do whatever you want to do with your body as long intellectually you consent to the beliefs. They were focused more on belief than behavior. And he said, no. <laughs> Paul was fighting the legalists. James was fighting the intellectuals. Paul focused on faith and belief. Yes, by faith you are saved. You put your faith and trust in Jesus. That's how you're saved. And when you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, you become a Christian. Today we're going to have the dedication of James and Isabel. When they grow up, they know who Jesus is, believe in their hearts, confess with their mouth, they become Christians. And as a result of their belief and confession with their mouth, then they are baptized. That is when they are a believer and we administer believer's baptism. But today, the dedication is actually the dedication of, in a sense, we are dedicating them to the Lord, thanking God for the gifts they are. But it is a dedication of the parents. It's a dedication of Sul and Bindu. They are making a commitment that they will raise them in the fear of God. They will raise them to know Jesus. They will raise them to hear the word of God, believe the word of God. Respond to the impressions and the nudges of the Holy Spirit. It's a dedication of the parents. Yes, we are indeed grateful for the gifts they are. We are praying for God's protection. But they become believers and it is after they become believers we administer believers baptism. Number seven, Jesus, uh, James discerns a need and he realized the greatest need of the church and the greatest need of an individual is spiritual maturity. That's the greatest need. Today, we adore the babies. But when next year comes, five years from now, we don't want James and Isabel to remain as babies. Sunil and Bindu don't want them to remain as babies. They want them to grow up. They want to be strong. They want them to be able to grasp things intellectually. They want them to be able to relate to other people. They want them to reflect greater traits and qualities in their life. God desires, and as parents, we desire our children to grow up. It's a call to maturity. And James, being the pastor, his greatest desire, and he discerned the greatest need of the church was spiritual maturity. Therefore, in the book of James, he's giving instruction after instruction after instruction. Grow up. Grow up. Don't remain as a boy or as an infant. Grow up to manhood. Take up responsibility. So he's giving practical teachings. How can you know that you are growing? You are growing if you display, I want to confine because of the lack of time, five qualities. You are growing if you display these five qualities. And he refers to these qualities in his book. And I'm taking it from the book of James. And in number one, he says, you are growing if you display patience. Patience is a mark or a quality of a mature individual. You know, babies throw temper tantrums because they don't get what they want when they want it. They don't have the patience to what? Wait. Impatience causes trouble. 
And impatience later in our life causes you to do unholy things. Just reflect on the wrong decisions that you made. Just think of the troubles that came into your life because of impatient decisions. Paul, uh, James says, testings and tribulations produce patience. And patience produce maturity. I like an African proverb. It says, if you have patience, you can dig a well with a needle. <laughs> That's a lot of patience, isn't it? <laughs> if you have patience, you can dig a well with a needle. Patience is a mark of growth and mark of maturity. Number two, James says in chapter two that faith without works is what? Dead. He says a person comes to you with need and you use wonderful words but never minister to them in kind. You are moved emotionally but you never do anything for them. And James is helping us to ask ourselves, are we turning our emotion into action? That's a second quality of a mature individual. He or she knows how to turn the emotion into what? Action. You're not just emotional. All of us are emotional creatures, some more than the others. And we express our emotions, but we don't do anything practical for anyone. James says, it is not enough if you are just an emotional person. You need to become intentional and do something. Turn your emotion into action. Faith without works is dead. James is telling us, and he gives numerous in illustrations, that God is not impressed by your religious knowledge. God is not impressed by your degrees. You may be impressed. A few others may be impressed, but God is not impressed by my knowledge. God is not impressed by my academic degrees. God is not impressed by my emotional display. God is not impressed by how loud I shout, or how much I cry or wail, but God is impressed by my faith and obedience. That is what moves God, your obedience. And that is what James is emphasizing. Turn your emotion into action. Turn your emotion into obedience. That is what impresses God. And then James in chapter 2 says, If you are really religious, you will always do three things. What are they? One, you will visit and care for the orphans. You will visit and care for the widows. And then he says, you will also make sure that you are not stained by worldly practices. You will not become corrupt. You will not go near to those evil, corrupt places that will corrupt you or stain you. That is real religion. You will make sure that you don't go near and you will not allow anything to stain or corrupt you. That is pure and undefiled religion. When he talks about royal law. What is a royal law? Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Thou shalt love the Lord your God with your heart, mind, soul, and strength. But thou shalt love your neighbor as yourself. And James calls it the royal law. It was given by Moses. You read that in the book of Leviticus chapter 19. Then we read how Jesus himself sanctioned that. And you read that in the Gospels. And James teaches that. And by the way, it is still in effect. That law is still in effect. 
that law is not just confined to the New Testament, the Old Testament time. It is still in effect. That is why James calls it the royal law. Number three, you are growing and you are spiritually mature if you have tamed your tongue. You are mature and growing if you tame your tongue. James says it's the smallest member, but the hardest member to tame or control. In our own strength, we cannot control our tongue. Only God can help us control our tongue. James says tongue will stain the body. A tongue can ignite fire, divisions, and factions. It can cause restlessness, and it is full of deadly poison. He says, allow God to control your tongue. He says, you are not a mature person. You are not growing spiritually if you have not learned to put a bridle on your tongue. Number four, you are growing. You are mature. And you are maturing if you know how to pray with the right motive. Notice in chapter 4, he says, you pray and you ask. But God doesn't seem to answer. Why? Because you are asking with the wrong motive. Some people don't ask. He says, you have not because you ask not. But if you ask, you need to make sure that you're asking with the right motivation. God knows my intent. And God wants to make sure that my intents and motivation is sanctified by the Holy Spirit. And God will honor sincere prayers that are offered with the right motivation. How often we ask, like James and John asks for position or status or material things. And James himself says, you ask because you ask with the ulterior motivation. Your motivation is greed and material possessions. He says, don't do that. Don't do that. Pray for the glory of God. Pray that his kingdom will be expanded. Pray to fulfill the great commission. Pray and ask the Holy Spirit to sanctify your Motivation. And if you offer sincere prayers, God will hear and answer those prayers. As you get older, make sure your focus is on God, not on gold. Make sure your focus is on God, not on material things. And if your focus is on God and eternal things and not temporal things, God will bless and honor. Number five. He says, you are growing, you are maturing if you humbly obey the word of God. This is the instruction of James. You are growing if you humbly obey the word of God. And James makes sure he begins by emphasizing that in chapter 1. And he says, when you come to hear God's word, you need to have a certain attitude. When you are, if you are in, invited to the White House, doesn't matter what party you belong to, whether you like the president or not the president, if you're invited to the White House, there is a protocol. You don't just walk in there with torn jeans, <laughs> unless you are a comedian. <laughs> There is a protocol. There is a background check. You have to meet certain requirements to have that appointment with the president of this country. You don't just walk in. When you meet with God and have fellowship with God, there is a protocol. There are certain requirements. And James says the protocol is before you come to have fellowship with God, you need to come with a clean heart. In other words, James is saying there should be always, always, always the protocol of cleansing before communion. Cleansing before fellowship. 
you don't approach a holy God however way you like. In fact, the whole book of Leviticus, the Old Testament, was trying to teach the people of God how you approach a God. In the New Testament, you confess. You believe, you confess. You realize you're a creature, a puny little creature, coming before a great, mighty God who controls your destiny. You humble yourself. You come, the attitude you need to have before is clean, cleansing. While you listen during the sermon, during the teaching, you come with meekness. This is for me. This is not just for my neighbor. This, is, this word is for me. This word as a two-edged sword, while it cuts you, it cuts me as well. I come with humility. Then he says, after you hear the word, after you leave the sanctuary, after you leave the church, there's another attitude. That attitude is, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. You make a commitment as you leave that you will obey the word of God. That you will respond to the word of God. Humble obedience is a mark of of maturity is a mark of growth. In other words, if you're not patient, if you don't turn your emotion into action, if you don't control or tame your tongue, if you don't pray with the right motive, and if you do not humble yourself in obedience to the word of God, you're not growing, you're not maturing. God wants us to mature. James says, if you know what is right and do not do it, it is sin. Chapter 4, verse 17, he says, If you know what is right and do not do it, it is sin. Two boys were talking one to another. And one said, looked at his face and said, I know what you had for breakfast this morning. So tell me, what did I have for breakfast this morning? You had egg curry for breakfast this morning. And the other boy said, I did not have egg curry for breakfast this morning. I had it day before yesterday. He knew what was wrong with his face. He knew there was leftovers of the egg curry on his face. He still did not do anything about it. If you know what is right and do not do it, it is sin. You are growing if there is a humility and obedience to the word of God. This is what James is teaching us. I pray this will be reflected in the life of not only James and Isabel, but all of us. And as you know, the word Isabel comes from the word Elizabeth. And Elizabeth means devoted to God. And she was devoted to God all her life. She wanted to please God. Although being older, she honored God in everything. I pray James and Isabel will honor God and be devoted to God all the days of their life. 